Our scripture reading this morning reminds us of God's amazing love for us. I invite you to hear these words from 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. This is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us, uh, he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on that day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What a great joy it is to be here at Grace United Methodist Church today. Uh, I, I have a, a long history with your congregation, though you don't have any history with me. Uh, but one of my very first mentors was a retired pastor who was on staff at the first church I served as a pastor. His name is Greg Robertson. And uh, Greg taught me so much through the years. More recent history that uh, I share with you, uh, I went through the ordination process with uh, a young guy named Will Rice. And I was so impressed with uh, that guy that when we had an opening on our staff at university, we hired him. And he was so great, I felt guilty because I knew that you all would be missing him. So believe it or not, I introduced a, a guy who was my intern for two years while he was at Duke Seminary, a guy named Mark Montgomery. I introduced him to John Wright. And so uh, I felt like that was a pretty good trade. Uh, and when Mark was here as an associate pastor, I was uh, visiting with him and he was so excited about you all. He loves you so much and was so excited about the work that God was doing here in the congregation. And this is my second time to stand here. The first time I stood here, it was just Mark and I. And there was nothing here. It was an empty field. Uh, this church had just received this property. And Mark and I came and we walked around the property, the acres here, and we crisscrossed it in prayer. And we prayed together for what God would do here with the people of Grace United Methodist Church. And so it's an honor, truly, for me to be here with you. You know, I do want to say one thing about Pastor Stan. I had absolutely nothing to do with his coming here. At all. <laughs> so please don't hold him against me. No, I'm kidding. I love Stan, uh, and I'm so excited, was so honored uh, when he asked me to come and share with you while he's on his renewal leave. Thank you for doing that for him. I think we all can agree he needs to be renewed just a bit. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself. He's not here. <laughs> but it is a joy to be here with you. I grew up in the United Methodist Church. In fact, I grew up in a very traditional United Methodist Church in Friendswood, Texas. We had one of those shotgun sanctuaries that was built after World War II on the model of the old European cathedrals. And my family sat on this right side over here, kind of three quarters of the way back. I'm pretty sure my mom picked that pew because it was just out of eye contact range with the preacher. Uh, he couldn't quite see back that far, so we were safe back there. My dad was a troublemaker. We'd get dressed up and put on our suits and ties and come in church, and I'd sit next to my dad, and during the service, he'd reach over and grab my leg just above my knee and start to squeeze until I started to wiggle and squirm and cry out in laughter. And then my mom would look down the row and tell me to be quiet. <laughs> I grew up in that church, and I'm grateful for all the experiences I had in Sunday school and youth group. They formed me to be a person who believed in God. That church was 
so important in raising me and shaping me and giving me a solid foundation of faith. But I like to share with people that growing up in the United Methodist Church, I got a faith that was neck deep. You know what I mean by that? I had an intellectual faith that was in my head. I believed with everything that I had in my head that the Bible was true and that God was real. I had an intellectual faith. I had a scholastic understanding of the person of God. I knew a lot about God. And it surprised me when I went to college and I was having a conversation with one of my very good friends. And I was shocked to learn that he was not a Christian. And he was shocked to learn that I was. You see, my friend couldn't look inside my head to see what I believed. He could only see the way I lived my life, and what I did, and what I said. Based on that, he had no idea that I was a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. And it humbled me. It made me think through this intellectual faith that I had. So I started attending this little Methodist church on the east side of Austin. And while I was there, I began to notice that the people who were around me, they believed the same things that I believed. They lived their life by the same code of ethics and morality. They followed the same Bible that I knew and believed to be true. But they lived their life so differently than I was living mine. They seemed to have a joy to their faith that was contagious. And I wanted it too. I wanted to experience that same kind of joy in living out the faith that I saw these people around me living out. And so I became a desperate man. I got down on my knees and I began to beg God for a faith that would go past my neck and enter into my heart. Forgotten were all the flowery prayers that I had memorized and learned and the words of the creeds. I was a desperate man on his knees begging God to reveal Himself to me. Please God, I would pray, let me know that You're real. I want to know more than just about You. I need to know You personally, intimately. I need to know that you're real. See, my intellectual faith had given me this understanding and idea of God as being real, but somehow distant. You want to know my conception of the Godhead? I thought of God as this father, bearded, long flowing white beard, gentle and kind, sitting on his throne in heaven. And there sitting next to him was the Prince of Heaven, Jesus, who had come to earth but who had gone back to heaven and someday he would be coming back again. And then, of course, there was the Holy Ghost. We didn't talk about the Holy Spirit in the church where I was raised, but we sang the doxology and so every week we sang about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And in my child's mind... I translated that to Casper the Friendly Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's how I understood the Spirit of God. Casper the Friendly Holy Ghost who would kind of float down from heaven and hover near me watching what I was doing. Seeing what I was doing right and taking notes on what I was doing wrong. And then he'd kind of float back up to heaven and he'd file his report with the Father and the Son. And based on those reports that he submitted, we determine whether I went to heaven or hell. This is how I understood God and faith. I'm telling you, it was neck deep. And I don't hold that against the church or my family that raised me. I have no doubt that there were spirit-filled people all around me, but I had a child's eyes that only saw himself. <laughs> But as I got older and I began to have eyes that looked around me, I saw that there was more to faith and more to life than I had yet to experience. And so I became a desperate man 
down on his knees, begging God to reveal himself to me. I didn't have the words to say what it was I was asking for, but I was begging God for a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I needed my faith to come alive. And I remember asking God for a sign or a miracle, a wonder. I said, you gave Moses a burning bush. Light something on fire for me. <laughs> and during that period of time, I'd be driving around town. Every time I'd see a little brush fire on the side of the road, and is that you, God? And do you know, while with my eyes, I was looking all around me on the outside, God was doing something on the inside. While my eyes were looking for an outward sign, God was working an inward grace in my heart. He was answering my prayer, and God did for me the hardest thing there is to do in the universe. He changed my human heart. It's easy to light something on fire. Any fool with some Girl Scout water and a book of matches can do that. That's lighter fluid, Girl Scout water. <laughs> but you know, only God can change a human heart. And you and I in this place know how hard that really is. But that's what God did for me. He sent forward His Holy Spirit to baptize me in love and in power. And in our Scripture reading this morning, we discover what it is we are baptized into. Because when God sent His Spirit to me, and my faith went past my neck and into my heart, the rule, the reign of sin in my heart was broken. And in its place, the love of God came to dwell to rule, and to lead me. John tells us that this love that God sends to us is the very nature of who God is. He says it simply, God is love. And so I want to be sure that you caught in this passage how it is that you can access this love of God. John puts it plainly in 1 John chapter 4. In verse 15, he says these words, If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. The access, the open door to engaging the nature, the personhood, the very definition of the core of who God is at the center of His being is by professing our faith in Jesus Christ. Confessing that He is the Son of God, the Savior of all men, and the Lord of all. When we profess the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and we give Him rule and dominion in our hearts, the rule and reign of sin is broken and love enters in. It is here that you and I access this great love of God. And church, hear me, this love of God is so much bigger and richer and deeper than the ooey-gooey, squishy kind of love we see about in TV and listen to in songs. It is a deep, abiding, transforming love that changes us from the inside out. I need the kids' help here for just a second. I know sometimes mom and dad tell you, shh, in church, but I need you to go ahead and speak out for me. We're going to play a little game called Good Mom, Bad Mom, Good Dad, Bad Dad, okay? All right, I'm going to ask you a question. Good mom or bad mom? The mom that makes you eat fruits and vegetables every single day. Whoa! Now be honest. Good mom or bad mom makes you eat vegetables every single day? Good mom. That's right. Alright, good mom, bad mom. Mom that lets you eat so much candy that your stomach hurts and your teeth fall out and gives you more every time you ask for it. A bad mom, yeah. All right, good dad, bad dad. 
Dad who makes you go to bed even when you want to stay up later so that you can get the rest you need to grow strong and do well. Good dad. All right, good dad, bad dad. Dad who lets you go out and play in the busy street totally unsupervised. Good dad. Oh. The youth are helping the kids. <laughs> Yeah, you know, these kids kind of instinctively, intuitively know what makes a good parent. It's not necessarily the parent who gives them everything they want, but it's the parent who makes sure they have what they need. Even children understand that love includes discipline, rules, Ways of ordering and structuring their life to allow them to grow strong and healthy and live the life that God wants them to have. And adults, you and I in this place know there's far more dangerous activities that you and I engage in than eating too much candy or playing in the street. Things that threaten our very lives, our very souls. But kids instinctively know that a good and loving parent is one they can ask for anything they want, but who will always deliver exactly what they need. That's the kind of love that God gives to us. That's the kind of love that defines His character and His personhood. It's a love that provides for us all of our daily needs. It's the kind of love that has more for us than we even know how to imagine for ourselves. Let me say that again. God's love for us is the kind of love that has more for us than we even know how to want for ourselves. I can show that to you. The reason why John is writing this letter, the reason that he wants for us to know what the love of God is, he shares his reason for writing in chapter 5, verse 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. To give you assurance and confidence as you receive the love of God and as you live out the life that He intends and wills for you to have, as you participate in this great love that He sheds abroad inside your heart, that you might know there is more in His love than you even know how to imagine for yourself. We ask for more candy and to stay up late and to play in the streets. And His love is promising a life that is everlasting because His love has more for us than we can even imagine for ourselves. So what then shall we do in response to this great love, church? How shall we live in response to a God who breaks the rule of sin in our lives and sheds abroad His great love in our hearts. John says in chapter 5, verse 3, that our response is to love God. And again, not an emotional, sentimental kind of love, but a love that is deeper and more abiding. In verse 3 he says, this is love for God. To obey His commands. And His commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is how we love God in response to His love for us. We obey His commands. Knowing that they are not burdensome or troublesome, but they represent more than we know how to imagine for ourselves. Church, I don't know where you are in your faith life. If you're here or here, or perhaps your faith goes from your head to your toes. But if you want to experience more of the love of God, more of a life of faith, 
I pray you would get down on your knees and beseech God, beg God to baptize you by the power of His Holy Spirit. The first act of which is the breaking of sin in your heart and the establishment of the law of love. And having received that great gift, I pray you rise and go to live in faithful obedience to that great love that God has given us. Amen.